Here at the Command Valley Podcast, we were inspired to make EDH content that was a little bit more different and unique than you've usually seen. You're watching one of 12 Elder Dragon Highlander games consisting of four of the same players. However, there's a twist. The goal of the season is to attain as many points as you can. Points are awarded by wins, plays, and other interesting challenges. The player at the end of the season with the most points wins. Welcome to Duel of the Peaks. All right, guys, welcome to Duel of the Peaks, episode three. I am Caleb. I am Peter. And we are going to be your hosts for this episode today. So just in case you haven't watched one of our Duel of the Peaks episodes before, in these gameplay videos, we are having the same four players play a series of 12 games throughout the year. And in each of those games, there are challenges and points both for t the table, the whole table, and each individual player that can be completed for certain amounts of points. And at the end of the, the 12 episodes, at the end of the season, whoever has the most points wins the entire season. It, the goal of this is to introduce different kinds of play styles and different kinds of strategies that you normally wouldn't see in a commander game, uh, where there are alternate objectives and different things that the players are playing for more than just winning the game. All right, let's go to some of those table challenges that we've talked about. In all of these videos, you'll see that you get three points for winning the game. And then in this one, we've got two points for each each of the personal challenges. We'll go into those a little bit later when we're talking about the opening hands. And the first table-wide challenge for this game is for two points, and it is if you have the most anthems or reduction effects throughout the entire game. And another one for two points is if you have the most anthems and reduction effects out at the same time, but you cannot win both. So that means two players that play the most anthem or reduction effects, even if they get wiped off the board, there, there will be two players that end up getting these two points. So some examples of reductions are like Dragon Speaker Shaman for dragons. An example of an anthem is something like the Lord of the Accursed that gives all zombies plus one plus one. And then uh, the final challenge is you get one point if you have the most non-token creatures of your tribe out at the same time in any point of the game. One thing to note is that all of the creatures in our deck are 100% our tribe or they interact specifically with our tribe. For example, Caleb is playing a zombie deck but has included Kalidus Traitor of Get. And, and Peter is playing a Dragon Speaker Shaman in his deck because it specifically gives a reduction to dragons. So this means we've excluded cards like Morophon, that's a shapeshifter, that, which is technically a dragon, but it doesn't specifically say dragons on the card. So we've excluded all cards like that. That's a good point. All creatures like that. All right, with all that out of the way, let's move on to the opening hands. All right, so Landon is playing a merfolk deck with Kumena at the helm. And in his starting hand, he's got a counter spell, a negate, expel from Araska, cultivate, prime speaker Zagana, woodland stream, and, I and an island. And one thing to note about our personal challenges is that nobody knows what the other player's personal challenges are. And Landon's for this game is to attack with five unblocked creatures. Caleb is helming the Scarab God as a zombie trial, tribal deck. His opening hand contains Wayfarer's Bobble, Negate, Windfall, Vizier of the Scorpion, an island, and two swamps. And his personal challenge is to reanimate a creature from each opponent's graveyard Ooh. over the course of the game. Yep. And Peter is playing dragons with the Ur Dragon at the helm. Peter's starting hand is a Soul Ring, Dragon Speaker Shaman, Nicol Bolas the Ravager, Jun Panorama, Overgrown Tomb, Island, and a Swamp. And his personal challenge is attack with a creature each turn if able. And last we have, and last but not least, we have Griffin. He is playing an Edgar Markov deck, a vampire tribal deck, probably one of the best vampire. He is a very scary vampire, very scary tribal Indeed. commander. His opening hand contains Soul Ring. Vampire Hexmage, Gifted Aetherborn, Rakish Air, a Mountain, and two Swamps. And Griffin's personal challenge is to gain 10 life and have an opponent lose 10 life in a single turn. This is sure to be an intense game. What do you think that we can expect out of a tribal-themed gameplay like this? Well, it, obviously with tribal, it is very creature-heavy. So uh, I think the player that has the 
strongest boards, the strong the strongest creatures on the board is going to end up taking control of the game. And uh, I'm I'm very interested. It looks like uh, Peter's going to be taking advantage of a lot of reduction effects with his commander and that dragon speaker shaman in his hand. Caleb is looking to start getting some power on the board and maybe start controlling the board with uh, Vizier of the Scorpion. And Landon is holding up a lot of counter spells, hopefully so he can draw into some powerful merfolk. And Griffin looks like he's got three vampires in his hand and and he's on curve to uh, to start playing some pretty scary stuff. Yeah, both Peter and Griffin have soul rings in their starting hand, so we're gonna see a lot of big stuff coming down really fast from them. And I'm gonna have to give, just before we even start the game, I, th I think I'm gonna have to say that Peter has the advantage here with all of those huge flying dragons. I feel like even though he might not get the most creatures out during and throughout the game, flying is not to be messed with. And since there are gonna be so many creatures on the board, evasion is gonna be huge in this game. All right, let's go to the start of the game. Landon is going first. Landon draws for his turn and he plays down a woodland stream, and he passes the turn. Caleb goes to draw, he plays a swamp, taps it, and plays down a, a Wayfarer's Bobble. Wayfarer's Bobble is awesome. And he passes the turn. Peter is going to draw, he's going to play down a Luxury Suite, and then he's going to pop out that Soul Ring. After he plays the Soul Ring, he passes the turn to Griffin, I think that that Sol Ring is going to be a little bit better than the Wayfarer's Bobble. <laughs> Just a little bit more powerful. Griffin goes to his turn, draws and plays a Swamp, taps it, and he plays his Sol Ring. <laughs> if I recall, he says something like, you know what's better than a Sol Ring? Two Sol Rings. <laughs> uh, Landon goes to his turn too, draws and plays a Snow-Covered Island and passes. Caleb draws and he's going to play down a Drowned Catacomb. He taps two to play down a Mire Triton. Uh, it looks like he got a Merfolk out before Landon was able to. <laughs> uh, there should be some points for that, I think. <laughs> he uh, mills the top two cards of his deck, getting a Lightning Greaves and a Go for the Throat into his graveyard, which are not really the cards that he wants to be in there yet. Those are definitely not cards that the Scarab God player wants to see in there. He yep. wants to see creatures. And he also gains two life from the Mire Triton. With that, Caleb passes the turn over to Peter. Peter draws and plays a Jund Panorama. He then immediately cracks the Jund Panorama. Peter grabs a mountain from his library, it comes in tapped, and with no mana left, he passes the turn. Griffin draws and plays an Isolated Chapel. It comes into play untapped because he has a swamp. Griffin then goes to cast Gifted Aetherborn, which is a 2-3 with Death Touch and Lifelink. It triggers Edgar Markov's Eminence ability, creating a 1-1 Vampire token. That is off to a really fast start for Griffin, and that creature is not to be trifled with. Lifelink and Death Touch on a 2-3 is a seriously good creature. Lennon goes to his turn three, draws and plays a forest. He then taps his three mana to play Deep Root Waters, which says whenever you cast a merfolk spell, create a 1-1 one, one blue merfolk creature token with hexproof. Uh, sounds a lot like Griffin's ability over there. Yeah, it's kind of like his Edgar Markov's Eminence ability, except that he had to pay three for it. <laughs> and, and those Merfolk come in with Hexproof. That's pretty good. I think that's a really good upside for actually having to pay mana for an ability. Yep. He passes the turn, Caleb draws, he plays an island, and then with his one creature, he goes to sw swing Meyer Triton at Landon. Landon takes two. After that, on, in his second main phase, Caleb plays Vizier of the Scorpion, which allows him to amass one, and then zombie tokens he controls have death touch. So the nice thing about this is that the zombie tokens that he gets from reanimating stuff out of people's graveyards is going to have the death touch because if you read the Scarab God, it says that the creatures that he reanimates from people's graveyards become zombies. Moving on to Peter's turn, he draws. He then plays his overgrown tomb. It comes in tapped. He doesn't pay the two life. And then he taps the rest of his mana to casts Dragon Speaker Shaman, which is a 2-2 that reduces the cost of his dragon spells by two. Man, Peter is off to a really good start. He's gonna start dropping some big dragons here pretty soon. Definitely. Don't forget that his commander's eminence ability is also a reduction. Griffin goes to his turn, uh, draws, plays a mountain. 
taps that mountain and his soul ring to play Rakish Air. Whenever a vampire you control deals combat damage to a player, you put a plus one plus one counter on it. That triggers his eminence ability and creates another vampire. Uh, he then goes to combat and swings Gifted Aetherborn and one of his vampire tokens at Landon. Landon takes three and Griffin gains two life from the Gifted Aetherborn. Uh, and then both creatures get a plus one plus one counter from Rakish Air. That Rakish Air is going to do a lot of work if the other players can't get things out to block with. Moving on to Griffin's second main, he taps the rest of his mana to cast Vampire Hex Mage. That triggers his eminence ability again and creates another 1-1 one, one vampire token. You should sacrifice it and remove all the ones from your vampire. That would be genius, genius. <laughs> All right, moving on, Landon starts his turn, draws a card, and plays an island. He then casts Cultivate, bringing an island into play tapped, and then a forest going into his hand. With that, he passes the turn. Caleb untaps and draws. He plays an island, and then he goes to combat. Please swing at me. You've got a bunch of stuff over there. Yeah, dude, swing at me. <laughs> Do your um... Seeing that Landon is the only player wide open, he swings the Vizier of the Scorpion and a token at him, and Landon takes two. With no further actions, Peter starts his turn. Peter untaps and draws. He plays an island as his land for turn. And it looks like Griffin's trying to guess what Peter's going to be playing this turn based on the mana that he just tapped. Let's dragon. listen in. Are you yes. casting a dragon? Uh, casting a dragon. Okay, so you're casting three, you're using red... Green and blue. Red, black, and red, oh, black. Oh, oh, is it Nick? Yeah. Looks like Griffin was right. Peter casts Nickel Bolas, the Ravager. When it enters the battlefield, each opponent discards a card. Griffin discards a Swamp. Caleb and Landon both discard Islands. This is a really powerful dragon that can flip into a Planeswalker. And this is exactly what I was saying uh, towards the beginning of this video, is that Peter's going to have such an advantage with those flyers. It's absolutely insane. And they're not just any old flyers, they're big flyers. With nothing else, uh, Peter passes his turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws. He taps three mana to play four Runner of the Legion. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, he's going to search his library for a vampire card, reveal it, and shuffle his library and put that card on top of it. And finds Champion of Dusk and puts it on top. A Forerunner of the Legion also has an ability when another vampire enters the battlefield, it can give target creature plus one, plus one until end of turn. It triggers the Eminence ability, creating another 1-1 one, one vampire token. Griffin goes to combat. He swings Rakish Air and a token at Landon, Vampire Hex Mage and two tokens at Caleb, and Gifted Aetherborn at Peter. Landon takes four, Caleb takes four, and Peter takes three, all declaring no blockers. And all of those creatures are going to get plus one plus one counters because of that Rakish Air, and Griffin gains three life. This is where we're going to see Edgar Markov really get out of control. It's it's crazy when he can just pay the normal casting cost for a vampire and get a second body onto the field. Especially with the powerful ability on that rakish air, they're going to get big. Couldn't agree more. After doing all of this damage, Griffin passes the turn to Landon. Landon untaps and draws for his turn. Landon taps three of his mana to cast his commander, Cumena. This triggers deep root waters and creates him a merfolk token with hexproof. At the end of Landon's turn, Caleb responds by cracking his Wayfarer's Bobble to get a swamp onto the battlefield. He then starts his turn, untapping and drawing a card. He plays a swamp. He then taps one black mana to play down Carrion Feeder. Looks like Caleb's got a proposition for the group. Let's go hear what he has to say. Cards in hand from everybody. Four, two, Four, two five. Five. Windfall? Who wants the windfall? Well, yes, I do want to win. Nope. But yeah, it's okay. go for it. <laughs> <laughs> so sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, we're in Windfall. Hearing some positive notes from the group, he taps three mana and plays Windfall. Landon responds to that by casting Expel from Araska, sending Rakish Air back to Griffin's hand, so he's now going to discard that. And then Windfall resolves, making everyone discard their hands and draw four new cards. Caleb discards Negate. Peter discards Smothering Tithe, Balefire Fire Dragon, Stomping Ground, and a Swamp. 
Griffin discards a Rakish Air, Radiant Destiny, and Stenzia Masquerade. And Landon discards Shamanic Revelation, Counterspell, Negate, and Prime Speaker Zagana. Nice. That was a good play by Landon to get rid of the Rakish Air and then have Griffin just send it right to the graveyard. Exactly. Hope everybody likes their new hands. <laughs> Peter goes to his turn, untapping, drawing, and then immediately casting Darksteel Ingot. He then taps two mana, a blue and a white, to cast Dragonlord Ojitai. That's right, he just paid two for that Dragonlord Ojitai. That is crazy cheap. And then he spends the remaining two mana to cast Colagan, which uh, gives creatures he controls plus one plus zero whenever a dragon attacks. He really powerful play from Peter here, dropping those two dragons for close to nothing. We're going to see some really big fireworks from Peter here, I'm sure. Definitely. Uh, Peter then goes to combat, and he swings Nickel Bolas at Caleb. Uh, no blocks declared. Caleb takes five. Looks like there's some more player interaction. Let's go to that. That would be nice. You, you didn't want to swing at Vampire Army over there? It was tempting. But I didn't. I sense fear in you, young Padawan. I sense... Draw. Something like that. Griffin goes to his turn, untaps, and draws. He then taps his soul ring for two to cast an Orzhov Signet. Bit of nice ramp there for Griffin. Mm -hmm. He then plays a Plains for turn and then casts Champion of Dusk. This triggers Eminence, creating another token. Griffin now controls nine vampires, so he loses nine life and draws nine cards from Champion of Dusk. Holy cow, that is absolutely nuts. That's an insane amount of card advantage, and I really don't think he's going to miss that life very much. He only goes down to 35 here. It's insane. Forerunner of the Legion also triggers, and he targets Vampire Hexmage, giving it plus two, plus two until end of turn. Griffin goes to combat. He swings Vampire Hexmage at Peter, gifted Aetherborn at Landon, and all of his vampire tokens at Caleb. Although one of them has summoning sickness. We didn't catch this during the game, uh, but it just means Caleb's gonna take one less damage than what's displaying on the screen. Uh, Landon takes four from gifted Aetherborn. Griffin gains four life. Caleb blocks nothing and takes eight damage. And then Peter takes five. Griffin ends his turn and has to discard a bunch of cards. While Griffin is choosing what to discard, Caleb is trying to get a feel for how things are going to go with Peter's end of the board and see if any of those huge dragons are coming at him. Let's listen in. Peter, are you going to attack me with dragons on your turn? It's a good question. Hmm. Attacking is a good bet. That I'm gonna attack. You could flip Nicholas Bolas. I could flip Nicholas Bolas. He could do a lot for me. Moving on, Landon starts his turn number six. He untaps and draws. He plays an island for turn. Then he casts Curse Catcher. He triggers Deep Root Waters to add another Merfolk. Then he casts Wake Thrasher, which also triggers Deep Root Waters, creating a third Merfolk. He now has six Merfolk on the battlefield. So something to note is that Landon is trying to create all of these Merfolk tokens and get as many out as he can because of Kumena's ability to tap down three Merfolk and then draw a card. And he can do that at instant speed. And this is really good with Wake Thrasher because what he'll do and what you'll see him do most likely is at the end of Griffin's turn, he'll tap down all of his Merfolk. And then at the beginning of his turn, when he untaps, the Wake Thrasher is going to take all of those untaps into an account, into account and get huge for a turn. Not to mention he's getting card advantage off of having so many of these guys on the field. Landon passes the turn. Caleb untaps and draws. He taps two to play an arcane signet. Nice. Yeah. High five. Thank you. That high five is well deserved. That is a great card. He then taps five mana to cast Eternal Skylord. Uh, similar to the Vizier of the Scorpion, it's going to amass him. He, he's going to amass two. And then all of his zombie creature tokens have flying. Peter untaps and draws. He plays a mountain. Um, so it looks like there's a lot of discussion going on about how and who Peter could or should attack. Sounds like some deals are going to be struck here. Let's listen in. So I can cast Peter, my you and I are behind in this in this scuttle that we've been having for the past two months. You are whoa, right. Whoa, whoa. You are right. What is this? Nothing. Just an alliance of the uh, the hierarchy. I don't have any flying. 
Yeah, I know. <laughs> he I know. has also at the highest life total with the most developed board. It's true. Yeah, his board and is he nuts. just drew nine cards. You are right. I will make sure that you regret it. You're going to regret it anyway. He wants to win the game. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he holds a point. If you swing at Griffin, I will not swing at you. I won't swing turn. at you either. Okay. All right. Um, I won't even counter your commander. <laughs> okay. Yep. All right. Yep. I think that seals the deal then. <laughs> <laughs> so let's see. I have to pay six, right? All right. So it looks like after all that discussion and a few threats, I think uh, Peter decides to make what I personally think is the correct choice. Uh, Peter taps six mana to cast the Ur Dragon, which is going to give him a lot of card advantage after he swings these dragons. He goes to combat. He swings Nickel Bullets. Ojutai and Colligan at Griffin. That triggers Ur-Dragon. He draws three cards and then he can put a permanent down onto the battlefield from his hand. He puts a Herald's Horn onto the battlefield, of course, choosing dragons. And Griffin, having nothing to block that flying, he takes all 22 of the damage. Ojutai then triggers, letting him anticipate the top of his library. Uh, choosing one card to put in his hand and putting the other two on on the bottom. This is exactly what I was saying with Peter's flyers. It almost doesn't even matter that Griffin has amassed this huge board when all Peter has to do is swing in with three or four huge flyers. It looks like things are getting really intense down there, so let's listen in again and see what the players have to say. Well, I've got blue-white control. Do you have a counterspell in here? That's sweet. I don't know. I can deal with this in exchange for also dealing with myself as well. Uh, ooh. That doesn't sound fun. You're just going to wipe the board. Are you going to cast Blasphemous Act? Well, I won't tell you what I have, but I will say that I have something that can level the playing field while still keeping almost everything of yours alive. What? That seems like it's too good for me. <laughs> You're also behind, and I'm also behind now. You are also behind. If you wipe the board, I'm fine with that. Okay. Hey, what and about that's, me? That's all I Ask if I'm fine. Yeah. That's all I have to say. No, man. Okay. Anything else? Um, no, not with that premonition. That premonition does not sound like a very happy one for most of the table. We're going to have to see what Griffin decides to do here. With nothing left to do, Peter passes the turn to Griffin. Griffin untaps and draws. Can you believe this guy? Just coming out with all those schemes. Everyone knows he's scheming. Oh, never deal with Griffin, that's for <laughs> sure. Griffin taps five mana to cast Fell the Mighty. Targeting his gifted Aetherborn, and then he destroys all creatures with power greater than four, so Peter's dragons die. And we made a little bit of a play mistake here. It looks like Nickel Bulls wasn't supposed to be destroyed. It was a 4-4 four, four and not a 5-4, like we thought. Um, it sounded like there was a lot of discussion going on about it being the same power and toughness, or maybe they thought that it was a 5-5. In any case, we thought that Nicol Bolas was supposed to be destroyed at this point, and now Peter does not have access to that, and that was a mistake. But from the coming events, uh, having Nicol Bolas on the battlefield was slightly inconsequential. Okay, after all of Peter's creatures are destroyed, basically, except for his reduction spell, Griffin continues to cast Legion Conquistador uh, that triggers Eminence and he creates another vampire token. He then casts another vampire, Cruel Celebrant, Eminence Trigger creates another vampire token. The Forerunner of the Legion is going to trigger on all of those creatures that enter the battlefield. Uh, so he pumps up his Vampire Hex Mage and his Gifted Aetherborn. Um, so his Vampire Hex Mage is a 4-3 and his Gifted Aetherborn is a 7-8 until end of turn. He then swings all of his Vampire Tokens that didn't enter the battlefield this turn, Gifted Aetherborn and Champion of Dusk at Peter. And then he swings Vampire Hex Mage at Landon. Landon takes the four, and Peter takes 21. Well, we're going to take a short intermission. Please enjoy the following. Oh, my goodness. 
Nice. Two, two, one, one. That's all you got. Um, two, four, four, four. That'll eat the crap out of my stuff. Um, off with your one, one. Yes, it is a mass two. Thank you. Got my three, three flying death toucher. Got a four, four, and a two, two. <sighs> this is not going out. This is move two. How much power do you have on board? You said 27. It's plus crap, plus crap. I've got at least 10. I have to grab two. I have all these islands. Ugh. And now back to our regularly scheduled program. <laughs> Uh, moving to the end of Griffin's turn, Landon taps his Curse Catcher, Wake Thrasher, and Cumana to activate Cumana's ability to draw a card. He then taps three of his Merfolk token to do the same thing, draw another card. And then lastly, he taps his three untapped lands to float three mana. So the reason he's doing this is he wants to, like I said before, untap as many things as he can so that his Wake Thrasher gets as big as possible. Lennon then starts his turn, untaps everything, and Wake Thrasher is going to get plus 12, plus 12 until end of turn. He then casts True Name Nemesis. He names Griffin. Good under choice. Understandably. Uh, that triggers Deep Root Waters to create another Merfolk token. He then casts Hadana's Climb. Uh, he then goes to combat, and he puts a plus one, plus one counter on Wave Thrasher with the Hadana's Climb. And then he ends his turn. He doesn't swing with anything. Caleb starts his turn, untaps, and draws. And all he's going to do on his turn is cast Endless Ranks of the Dead, hoping to rack up some zombie tokens. Uh, he's still got those two zombie token buffs that are going to... Uh, make them flying and death touch. So he's mostly just looking for more bodies and more protection on the board. Yeah, he's. I think that he's feeling like he might be losing the race here against these two um, other tribes that are creating tons of tokens at a time each turn. So I think he's just trying to get in on a little bit of that action. All right, moving to Peter's turn. Uh, on his upkeep, he looks at the top card of his library with his herald's horn. He does not find a dragon creature, so he just puts that back on top and then draws a card. He then casts Ramos for two mana because of all of the reductions on the board. Wow, that is one cheap Ramos. And then he's going to cast Dragon Lord Servant, uh, which is another reduction spell. Uh, note here that he casts the reduction spell after casting the dragon uh, so that he could start pumping up Ramos to hopefully get some more mana on that th coming out of that. Yeah, I think that's a good play. I think that's what he wants to do. Griffin untaps and draws. He then plays a swamp. So it looks like Griffin is going to try to make a deal with Caleb. Let's hear what they have to say. I will not attack you this turn. Okay. That is my turn. So I won't attack you. You didn't attack me. <clears throat> No attacks from me. And respond to what I do. No responses, no attacks, nothing. Okay. Then Griffin drops the bomb. He casts Kindred Dominance. Ooh. The best board wipe that you could possibly play in a tribal deck. In response to the Kindred Dominance, Landon taps Cumena and two of his Merfolk to draw a card. He then does it again with Wave Tra Thrasher and his two other Merfolk tokens to draw another card. He then sacrifices the Kurtz Catcher to force Griffin to pay one more for Kindred Dominance, which he does. And then the board is wiped except for all of these vampires that he has aboard. This is craziness. Uh, unless these other guys can come up with something, maybe cast a damnation from Caleb's deck or a cyclonic rift from Griffin's, or sorry, from Landon's deck, there is probably not a lot left that these guys can do to deal with this army of vampires coming at them. We'll have to see what happens. After Kindred Dominance resolves, uh, Griffin goes to combat. Griffin sends the majority of his army at Landon in an attempt to do exactly 21 points of damage uh, to wipe Landon out, and then swings the rest of his creatures at Peter. With nothing left to block, Landon takes the 21 and dies, and Peter takes 6 damage. Rip in peace, Landon. Rip in peace. Yeah, it looks like Landon just didn't really get the things that he needed to, just to start... Um, start really going off with those vamp those merfolk uh his wake thrasher was really big but 
ideally would he would have wanted a lot of low costing a low costing merfolk at this point yeah it's it's tough because it looks like he had his engine going it just wasn't fast enough to keep up with the vampires and it doesn't help that he got his entire board wiped by kindred dominance definitely not a really easy way to come back from that so landon for the first time is out of duel of the peaks first griffin nothing else to do it passes the turn over to caleb and caleb starts his turn number eight he untaps and draws after deliberating for a minute he casts kalidas traitor of get and then he casts Liliana's Reaver. Probably not feeling great that last turn he played that Endless Ranks of the Dead and is now getting absolutely nothing off of it because of that Kindred Dominance. And this is really not where he wants to be with just two creatures on the board. He's He doesn't have a lot to block with. Definitely. Caleb, nothing else to do, passes the turn over to Peter. Peter casts Felwar Stone and... Then, with all of his mana tapped, he casts Heliod's Intervention to gain 12 life, and he goes to 18. Now, personally, I think that uh, Peter should have held on to this Heliod's Intervention for a little bit longer, because uh, this is a great new card from the new set. It's an instant. Probably the first time he's played it. <laughs> yeah, it's mostly in there for an artifact and enchantment removal, but in this case, he, he was probably trying to just save himself from a fiery death. It's, it's hard to have to think about everything going on when you've got that much of an army that you're facing down, and... Um, I, I don't think it was a horrible play, but I think you're right. It definitely would have been better on Griffin's turn. This is basically just going to hand the fate of the game over to Caleb, most likely, since Peter is still wide open. With all of his mana tapped, Peter ends his turn. Griffin starts by untapping and drawing his card. Uh, let's, let's go house. <clears throat> okay. Griffin untaps all of those zombies that he swung out with last turn and draws his card. Looks like Griffin is trying to think here. He's doing some numbers in his head, trying to calculate how to win this game. Shouldn't be too hard after that kindred dominance. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> after thinking about it for a little bit, he casts Edgar Markov, his commander, for the first time this game. He then casts Captivating Vampire, triggering Edgar Markov to get another vampire token. Griffin, from these vampires, gets three Forerunner of the Legion triggers, so he... Uh, gives Gifted Aetherborn plus three plus three until end of turn. Then he goes to combat. He's swinging Edgar Markov, Gifted Aetherborn, Vampire Hexmage, and Vicious Conquistador all at Peter. Uh, then Griffin sends his five biggest vampire tokens at Caleb. Uh, that triggers Edgar Markov, putting a plus one plus one counter on each of his creatures. Caleb blocks two of Griffin's vampires. Uh, in response to those declared blocks, Griffin taps five of his vampires to attempt to gain tr control of Kalidas, uh, which su succeeds. Looks like he does. But w one of those vampire tokens is still blocked. Liliana's Reaver and one of his other tokens dies, uh, which triggers Cruel Celebrant, uh, making Caleb lose one life and Griffin gains a life. Then Caleb takes 10 in combat damage, and Peter uh, takes enough damage that he dies. Griffin gains another 9 life from the Gifted Aetherborn, uh, and he completes his challenge of dealing 10 damage to an opponent and gaining 10 life on a single turn. Nice rip, job. Rip in peace, Peter. Yep. Uh, it, you had a really strong start. You really did. Those dragon reductions are no joke. Um, I really, really would have bet this game on Peter and his crazy huge dragons. It's an absolutely insane deck. So sad to see the, the death of the dragon lord here, but very good play by Griffin. Yeah, and, and maybe things have, would have turned out differently if that Nicol Bolas would have stayed alive. Probably. Uh, but I... Uh, in the end, uh, there was nothing. He, Gr Peter did not have the bodies on the board to deal with the threat that that Griffin was. Yeah, Griffin uh, has nothing left to do, so he ends his turn, and it goes to Caleb. Caleb starts his turn number nine, untapping and drawing. He then casts Grey Merchant of Asphodel with four devotion, two from the Merchant and two from the Endless Ranks of the Dead. Uh, so he gains four life and Griffin loses four life. That's all that Caleb has to do on his turn. And so he passes. Griffin then goes to his turn, untapping everything on his board once again and drawing a card. He casts Stromkirk Captain 
uh, Edgar Markov and the forerunner of the Legion trigger here. Um, but really, in the end, he's going to swing out and it doesn't really matter what he chooses. Uh, he turns everything sideways and does enough damage to end Caleb. Yeah, I think that Caleb was just trying to make him go through the motions of finally finishing out that turn. He, he knew he was toast. He knew he was toast. <laughs> All right. With that, the game is over and Griffin has won. Good job, Griffin. Well, it was um, it was a little bit rough with a couple of play mistakes there, so sorry about that, guys. Um, what do you think that the turning point of this game was, Peter? I think I think the biggest moment of the game was when Peter swung with all. Of, he cast his commander and swung with everything at Griffin. I think. It wasn't necessarily the best play of the game, but it was definitely what decided I, um, the fate of Peter and basically everyone at the board because it, Peter did not leave anything up to block. He put a target on his back and Griffin decided to just... he That's what made him decide to cast Fell the Mighty and and eventually Kindred Dominance. It, it completely... It completely disrupted the game at, yeah. from that point forward. The, the fact that the player that was getting the most stuff out the fastest also had two one-sided board wipes. It was just crazy. If it weren't for those board wipes, I definitely think that dragons would have at the very least stomped over the vampire player, the va the vampire tribe completely. I think that Griffin was in a very tough spot there on, on that turn. He was definitely forced into a corner and had to react. Yeah, and I think Fell the Mighty was really the key card in that because that was a really one-sided board wipe mm -hmm. uh, to, to completely wipe out Peter's board and leave everyone mostly intact he didn't make enemies on the other side of the table really i mean everyone knew that he was the most powerful right um and he left peter in a really bad position and phil the mighty isn't one of those board wipes that you typically think about uh wanting to include but he he did a very good job with that um even if it wiped out a little bit more than it should have yeah for sure <laughs> Did a lot of work with those board wipes. Yeah. If I had to pick one card that really decided the game, I think it would be that. What would you choose for your card of the game? <laughs> Edgar Markov. <laughs> <laughs> I think everybody knows that Edgar Markov is just an absolute powerhouse. The, the difference between getting just one creature when you pay for one creature and getting two creatures when you pay for one creature is just astronomically huge and griffin did such a good job of taking advantage of those those extra tokens he didn't just go "Ooh, sweet i've got some extra tokens he buffed them up he tried really hard to get those guys in the fight get them big take advantage of them and it's eminence is just crazy strong yeah and and yeah really the two major players in this game were peter and griffin yeah we didn't see a lot of action from caleb or from from landon on their sides of the board i mean mm -hmm. when when that um when that board wipe, when those board wipes were hitting they were doing basically nothing i mean they were casting one or two creatures yeah they were kind of still in uh getting set up mode and trying to catch up i think is what it was and if if they would have had a couple more turns i think i think especially with griff or I think especially with Landon's engine of drawing tons of cards and having a ton of those merfolk out, I think he could have contended if not for that kindred dominance. And also don't discount that endless ranks of the dead because that gets crazy really fast, especially when uh, Caleb could have been reanimating a ton of powerful creatures from everybody else's graveyards and then adding more and more zombies each turn. So it wasn't, I don't think it's that they didn't do anything. It's that they weren't even able to get to the point where, the, where they could do something. Yeah. And maybe that's because the vampire and the dragon strategies were very aggro. They I were. Mean, the, the reductions were bringing out dragons really fast. And the 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 tokens were were making the vampire board completely overwhelming. And if one person would have gotten a board wipe out of any of the rest of of them, I uh, that probably would have been it for Very for, game. for Griffin because he he was relying heavily on the fact that he had so much numbers and yep. and it would have taken a little bit of time to build that back up. Although he did have quite the backlog of vampires that yeah. he was casting at the end. So really good, really fun gameplay. I hope that all of you guys enjoyed it. I still can't believe that Ojutai was cast for just two mana and Ramos for just two mana. Yeah. It could have been for one if Peter had played them the other way around, but I, I 
still like what he did there. Cannot believe he was getting those dragons for so cheap. If anything, I think that was the most entertaining part for me. Definitely. All um, right, with that, uh, let's go to our point totals. So, so at the end of the game, Caleb and Landon didn't score any points. They didn't complete any of the, their personal challenges. They they didn't have the most of their tribe or of anthems or anything on the board at that time uh, during the game, and and so they're not going to gain any points for this round. Man, that's pretty rough. That zombie deck was full of anthems and reductions, so it was really sad that we didn't even see one. Definitely. Peter, he ended up with the most Anthem and Reduction effects over th the course of the game. I... Uh, and, and uh, out at one time, at, at one point, he had four reductions at, at the same time. But he can't win both, uh, so he's going to walk away with two extra points, leaving him at a grand total of eight points, which is, which is actually tied with Caleb and Landon at this point. Very nice. Griffin got a lot of points here. <laughs> yeah, he Griffin, did. Griffin won the game, which means he gets three points, which is already going to put him at a tie with everyone else. But he also completed his personal challenge, which is another two points. He had the second most, he had, he got the other Anthem and Reduction Effect Challenge, um, having the most out uh, at the same time. So he gets two points for that. And he had one point for having the most, uh, most non-token creatures of his tribe out at the same time. So that's eight extra points for Griffin, gr bringing him to a grand total of 13 points. 13 points. Add, adding to his previous five. So the standings as they are right now is Griffin is in the lead with 13 points and everyone else is tied for second with eight points. That is crazy. So Griffin is five points ahead of everybody else. Um, that was a, cr that is an, crazy development in our season uh, and it's only game three and, and Griffin's yeah. now five points ahead of everybody. That came out of nowhere. Looks yeah. like the other guys are going to have to do a lot of hard work to catch up with him. Definitely, definitely. He may or may not be the most hated player in the next game. <laughs> We'll have to wait and see. This next month is also going to be full of Ikoria spo spoilers, so be watching out for deck techs, for deck upgrades, for the commander decks, and and more content about the upcoming set in Ikoria. Uh, we're really excited to talk about this super new set. Super excited. Uh, I, from what we've seen so far, we're just super, super pumped for the new mechanics and yeah. everything. All right, with that... Thank you for watching. Thanks, guys, girls, and goats. <laughs>